At one period of history or another, conquest has encompassed virtually all peoples, either as conquerors or as victims, and the consequences have been wide-ranging as well. Some conquests have been followed by systematic exterminations of the vanquished, as in Rome's conquest of Carthage, nor have such draconian policies been limited to major conquerors of historic dimensions. The massacres of the Tutsi by the Hutu, and vice versa, in late twentieth-century Africa, and ethnic cleansing in the Balkan Wars of the same era, clearly show that it does not take a great power to create great human tragedies. Nor have the much-idealized Polynesians been immune. On the Chatham Islands, five hundred miles east of New Zealand, centuries of independence came to a brutal end for the Moriori people in December 1835. On November 19th of that year, a ship carrying five hundred Maori armed with guns, clubs, and axes arrived, followed on December 5th by a shipload of four hundred more Maori. Groups of Maori began to walk through Moriori settlements, announcing that the Moriori were now their slaves, and killing those who objected. A Maori conqueror explained, We took possession in accordance with our customs, and we caught all the people. Not one escaped. Some ran away from us. These we killed, and others we killed. But what of that? It was in accordance with our customs. Spontaneous atrocities and deliberate, systematic terror have long marked the path of the conqueror. The Mongol hordes who swept across vast reaches of Central Asia, Eastern Europe, and the Middle East cultivated an image of ruthless barbarities as a calculated strategy to demoralize future victims. But although the Mongols excelled in such practices, they had no monopoly of them. The Normans did the same. Emperor Basil II of the Byzantine Empire in the 11th century ordered the blinding of ninety-nine of every one hundred Bulgarian captives, leaving each one hundredth man with only one eye to lead the others back home, so as to provide graphic evidence of the emperor's treatment of his enemies. It was a common practice in the Ottoman Empire to present the sultan with pyramids of severed heads of enemy soldiers, usually defenseless prisoners, sometimes numbering in the thousands. Twentieth-century conquests have been equally hideous. The Japanese conquest of the Chinese capital of Nanking in 1937 was followed by an orgy of rapes of thousands of women living there, the use of Chinese soldiers and civilians for bayonet practice, and a general wanton slaughter of civilians. Similar atrocities marked Japanese conquests throughout Southeast Asia during the Second World War. Their allies, the Nazis in Germany, set new lows for brutality and dehumanization, of which the Holocaust against the Jews was only the worst example. While conquest has often produced horrifying tragedies, its consequences have extended far beyond those tragedies. In some cases, where whole ways of life have changed in the wake of conquest, later generations of the conquered peoples have been born into an enlarged world of ideas, of technology, and of possibilities undreamed of by their ancestors. It is both unnecessary and impossible to determine the net advantages or disadvantages of conquest. Often the benefits and the losses have each been of staggering dimensions and long durations with consequences that have been cultural, institutional, and biological. The ever-changing technology of warfare has been no more evenly spread among the peoples of the world than other cultural advantages. Mastery of fighting on horseback made Central Asians the greatest conquerors in the world for centuries on end, winning victories and empires from China to Eastern Europe. Only after the development of more formidable fortifications and the invention and perfection of handguns and cannon was the cavalry charge drastically reduced in its effectiveness, changing the balance of power among peoples and giving rise to new nations and empires based on the new technology. The rise of gunpowder weapons in particular marked the rise of Europeans as conquerors on the world stage whereas before then Europe had had difficulties even defending itself against the invasions of Mongols, Turks, and Moors. It was symbolic of this dramatic turnaround that the year the Spaniards finally liberated the last of their country from Moorish rule was the same year when Columbus set sail across the Atlantic. <laughs>
marking the beginning of the age of European worldwide empires. The very nature of European dominance evolved in step with the evolution of guns and cannon. Early, crude, inaccurate, and slow-loading firearms had no decisive advantage against fast-charging horsemen and fast-shooting archers. Although Europeans began making cannons in the first half of the fourteenth century, it was two centuries later before military battles began to be won by field artillery. The immobility of heavy early cannons, which limited their usefulness on land, was not as much of a handicap at sea, however, where the warship itself provided the mobility for its cannon, leading to European dominance on the oceans of the world long before the mass territorial conquests which created European land empires overseas. The technology of shipbuilding and the science of navigation were crucial in determining which European powers would become the militarily predominant ones, both in Europe itself and overseas, raising some to new heights and reducing others from their former preeminence. Venice, for example, was the leading sea power of the continent for centuries before the era of sail and cannon, but later had to be protected from Spanish naval attack by the warships of their British and Dutch allies in the early 17th century. With the development of lighter, more mobile, more accurate, and faster-firing artillery, as well as corresponding advances in pistols and rifles, the balance of military power shifted decisively to the Europeans, on land as well as at sea. Conquests often have not only cultural consequences, but also cultural antecedents. While one culture may be more effective militarily, and another culture more effective economically, in many cases the two things interact. For example, more efficient methods of agriculture or industry, capable of supporting higher population densities on a given amount of land, can give one side decisive military advantages in launching attacks with larger armies whose conquests then spread more effective economic methods to new lands or peoples. In ancient times, sedentary agriculture was an epoch-making advance beyond seeking food by hunting or gathering the spontaneous products of nature, or by transient slash-and-burn planting methods. Because sedentary agriculture supported much higher population concentrations, it spread and transformed the world, not only by example, but also by conquest. Those groups still practicing slash-and-burn methods of cultivation, which usually support only thin population densities, were often forced off their lands and up into the hills or out into the hinterlands and backwaters by people from regions with more dense populations made possible by sedentary agriculture. Hunter-gatherers, who had not yet achieved even primitive forms of agriculture, were of course even more thinly spread, and therefore even more vulnerable. Rice cultivation supports especially heavy population densities, so it is not surprising that the irrigation systems crucial to rice cultivation in many parts of Asia were spread by conquests in China, India, and the southeastern regions of the continent. Ultimately, it is not simply territory that is conquered, it is people and their subjugation can take the form not only of political subordination, but also of enslavement, whether in their own homelands or in other lands to which they are transported. Here, too, environmental factors have been major influences, more so than race, for example, in determining who would and would not be enslaved. While slavery existed around the world for thousands of years, and has been abolished generally only within the past two centuries, it tended to decline with the rise of many powerful nation-states, whose armies and navies stood between their own people and marauders from outside who might attempt to capture and enslave them. Thus, the consolidation of nation-states around the world reduced the number of peoples who remained vulnerable to enslavement. The regions of the world which continued to be subjected to mass enslavement had much more in common geographically than racially. Typically, these were regions where internal geographical barriers made it more difficult to consolidate political control over areas large enough to produce powerful nation-states, able to protect their populations from marauding outsiders. The Balkan Mountains, which fragmented peoples culturally and isolated them from the economic and intellectual advances of the outside world, 
made this region a major supplier of slaves for centuries before Europeans turned to Africa as a source of slaves for the Western Hemisphere. Such geographical handicaps had other counterparts which kept the peoples of sub-Saharan Africa isolated from one another, as that whole region remained insulated from the outside world by the vast Sahara Desert to the north and three oceans on its other sides. In Asia as well, geographical isolation and the technological backwardness which so often went with it left many vulnerable peoples in stateless societies like those of Bali, which was raided for tens of thousands of slaves by peoples from more fortunate places. Other stateless peoples, or peoples only nominally part of states which lacked effective control of remote regions, continued to be victimized by marauders who captured and enslaved them. Hill tribes, slash-and-burn agriculturalists, scattered bands of nomads and others living in the remote backwaters of Asia continued to be raided and enslaved on into the twentieth century. In short, what successively removed various peoples of the world from the ranks of those vulnerable to being enslaved was the long process of consolidation of state power, whether their own or that of European imperialist nations. Thus, slavery was ended in the Philippines, for example, only after the American conquest of the islands, which did not simply replace the pre-existing authorities with new ones, but replaced them with a more powerful government in firmer control. In the Indonesian islands as well, the advance of Dutch power marked the retreat of slavery. More generally, the spread of Western imperialism in Asia during the nineteenth century was the principal factor in the decline of slavery there. In Africa, slavery remained resistant on into the twentieth century, but here, too, it was the consolidation of European power that forced back the frontiers of slavery, whether it was the consolidation of French power in Morocco or Senegal, British power in many parts of Africa, or other European power in other regions of the continent. What was crucial to this development was the emergence in Western civilization of a general revulsion against slavery in the late 18th and early 19th century. This anti-slavery movement became and remained politically powerful enough to force political leaders and colonial officials into opposition to slavery, regardless of whether they personally felt such revulsion or not. The other crucial factor was that the West had such overwhelming military superiority at the time as to be able to enforce anti-slavery policies around the world, as it imposed its will in other matters. <laughs>